Hey, welcome again to Discovery. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. Come on. Y'all ready to receive the word of God today? I, I'm so excited you're here. We're in this last installment of this series called Freedom. And it's more than a series. We're believing this year is going to be a year of freedom that we just decided here at Discovery, we're going to go on this journey of working out things in our life and getting truly free, free indeed. And so if you've missed any of these sermons, the messages on Sunday, you can catch online on YouTube or our website. But I have been drilling into you two primary truths to the journey of freedom. If you're here today and you're going to go on the journey, you're interested in going on the journey of what God calls freedom and, and you want to access that yourself, there are two foundational truths that we need to understand. The first is this, you're only as free as the truth you believe. So the, the journey of our faith is actually a journey of knowing and discovering truth and then applying, believing that truth in your life. That is actually a great definition of the Christian journey and spiritual maturity. Like how mature you are in the things of God is actually how much of the truth of God that you just don't know, but you've applied and are living out in your life. That kind of truth has the power to set you free. And so we're going to go on that journey, but there is a second truth that is equally important. That is this, that when you believe the lie, you empower and enthrone the liar in your life. And Jesus called him the father of lies, Satan. And that's kind of where I want to talk about today. We're going to go to the deep end of the pool today. Can we study the word of God a little bit? Okay. So I hope you've got your Bibles and you're ready to take some notes. Because here's what I want you to understand. That this freedom thing, this life, this journey of our faith, it's a lot more spiritual than you realize. So, so there's, there's two ways the enemy attacks. Two ways the enemy attacks, okay? Two primary ways. And if you hear today, when you hear things about like, oh, the enemy, or even spiritual warfare, demonic spirits and things like that, you, you hear that, you're probably on a spectrum. Everyone's on like, so if we have this line graph here, you probably are on the line graph in, in, in some place of either I don't believe it at all or I'm like all about it. Because some of you are on this extreme of this whole spiritual warfare, demonic thing where you, you not only believe it, but you're like, you're like you, you live it, man. Like, you know, you know more names of demons than you do names of God, and that's a problem, okay? So you're way over here, and you think, like, everything is, is the demons, the spiritual warfare, and, and even, even believers can be de demon-possessed and stuff. And I want to challenge some of the thoughts and ideologies of, of any extreme here. And I would just say for any, everyone here today, give me, give me like 30, 40 minutes to go through a study of the Word of God together without putting up walls and, and creating defenses in your own mind. And, and let's, at the end of truth, let's then d decide, but g give, give me 30, 40 minutes of, of researching, studying the word of God. And I think today, what I'd like to do is expose deception, confusion, but also give clarity and enlightenment today because there might be extreme thoughts on this end, but then others on the whole other end of the spectrum can be some of you are like, well, yeah, I get it. There's spiritual warfare, spiritual things. There's demons and demonic stuff. I get it in the Bible, but then there's not really any practical implication in your life, like the way that you live your life, the way that you even walk out your faith, the way that you parent, or the way that you, you do your whole husband thing, or wife thing, or the way that you lead, like none, like the spiritual realm has no like bearing at all in some of your life and your faith. And, and I wanna challenge some of the extreme ideologies that you might be living and expose some of the deception confusion of the enemy today. Because I believe that's what's at the heart of the Apostle Paul's uh, words when he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, he said, I don't want you to be exploited by Satan. One translation says, taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So, so, so we don't want to be unaware of his schemes, which begs the question, what are his schemes then? What is the scheme of the end? Because if this is going to be a journey we're going to go on, then we need to understand who we're fighting against. We need to understand the tactics and the, the schemes of the enemy so that we can truly be free. Let's not be unaware. Let's not be exploited and taken advantage of because we just want to be passive and, and act like it's not happening. No, there's two ways the enemy attacks. The first is this. Write it down. Possession. 
We see that in the Bible. You see like there's demon possession. That's a thing. Actually, there's probably a more, uh, a better name for this. You may have heard demonized or, or, or demonization. That's, that's probably a more accurate um, uh, word choice there in the interpretation of Greek language. Whenever you see in the Bible, someone was demon possessed or oppressed by a demon, it actually is probably more accurately called demonized. They were demonized. And so I want to bring even clarity to that, this whole demonized or possession thing. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse one. It says this, that Jesus called to him the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to what? To cast them out. You have authority over every unclean spirit demonic evil spirit much in the about the unclean spirits though of demonic spirits in the gospels it's portrayed though with like outward demonstrations and manifestations of such evil that i think a lot of us we 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 read the bible or we hear these stories and we think well that's easy to spot if somebody's demonized somebody's demonized man, they're going to be running around the tombs and foaming at the mouth and breaking chains or levitating. So when you think of like, like possession or demonization, your mind goes to poltergeist and paranormal activity. You know what I mean? So I kind of want to challenge that theology, that ideology, and, and maybe, maybe it's a, a lot, maybe it's different than, than what, you're, what you're thinking. Let me give you a few other examples in the Bible of people who were demonized that hopefully you can think differently about what it means to be demonized or possess. So one occasion is where Jesus is in the upper room with all of his disciples. And he's, he's telling them, one of you is going to betray me. And we know who, which one that is. That's Judas Iscariot. But nobody else knows at the time. They're like, it ain't me. It ain't me. Who is it? And so nobody knows. But in John chapter 13, verse 27, it says, then after he, that's Judas Iscariot, had taken the morsel of bread. Look what it says. Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, I know you're going to betray me, go do it quickly. Now, no, none of the disciples looked at Judas when Satan entered him and they went, oh, there's the, there he is, he's foaming at the mouth, that's the betrayer. Look, it's Judas, he's levitating now. It's just, there he's filled. No, 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 it wasn't, that's not how it was manifested. His demonic, the demonization that happened to Judas, Judas did not manifest like you think it manifested. How did it manifest? Through deceitfulness, betrayal, selfishness. Ultimately, he was complicit in doing harm to Jesus himself. See, when you, when you look at the standard set, maybe by the scripture here of what it looks like to be demonized, you can probably discern now that there's a lot of people who are either politicians or very high in power that are demonized today. Why? Because they're deceitful, because they're betrayals, because they're selfish, because they want to do harm to Jesus and his church. That is the spirit of Antichrist. That is a demonized person that wants to do that, okay? So maybe, maybe it's more spiritual than you think. Maybe it don't look like what you think it, it looks like. Let me give you another example. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas are on their second missionary journey to Philippi in Macedonia, it says this, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which, look at this, she predicted the future, that this spirit gave her some sort of spiritual realm access to understand future things. She earned a great deal of money even from it, and money for her owners through fortune telling. So this whole fortune telling, palm reading, tarot cards, you guys, it's more spiritual than you think. That's demonic. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. You know why? There's no spirit that's more powerful than the Holy Spirit. That spirit did not want, want to leave, nor did she want the spirit, the evil spirit to leave. It was giving her money, benefiting her life. She didn't want that thing to go. It had to go in the name of Jesus because there was a greater name and greater authority that exerted itself there in that situation. See, Satan doesn't reveal himself in ways that are obvious. Remember, he's a master deceiver. He is a schemer, so he's not going to look the way and, and demonization and possess, like whatever that possession were, it's not looking how you think it is. In fact, the apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, but I'm, I'm not surprised, he said, even Satan disguises himself 
as an angel of light. He don't come at you with horns and stuff. That's not how he's playing this game. And even his servants, they're also disguising themselves as servants of righteousness. So, so when Christians, sometimes we, we, we see these things and we, we understand these things, it causes some Christians to be a little paranoid about evil, evil lurking around every corner, looking to devour me. Listen to me, that is an unfounded fear. Listen, I'll tell you why. Your relationship to demonic powers in the spiritual realm is, is very much like your relationship to germs in the physical realm. Okay, you know they exist, germs exist. You know germs are in the air, you know germs are in the water, you know germs is in the food, you know germs is in the dude next to you. No, I'm just kidding, but probably don't freak out on me. But they, they got germs, you know what I mean? But, but so what should you do? Should you live in fear of the germ? No, you don't live in fear. If you did, there's a name for that. It's called a hypochondriac. And some people are hypochondriac, they're germophobic, right? They're hypochondriac. There are some people in the spiritual realm, they are hypochondriacs to all things spirit. They live in fear of it. And you need to understand, child of God, listen to me. You have a spiritual immune system that can defeat the germs of the devil. And greater is he that is in you than is he, than he that is in the world. Now, as we look at this, now, now stick with me. Don't put up walls. Some of you are on, on one extreme or the other. Just go on this journey. As I look at the word of God, I do not believe it is biblical, accurate, or true that a child of God, a son and daughter of God can be demonized or possessed. Now, I want to show you in the scripture why. Every time you see, depending on what Bible you have and you read it, every time it says uh, possessed by a demon, or maybe your Bible says oppressed by a demon. It's the same Greek word that's used there in the New Testament. And the word is demonizomai. It's where we get the word demonized, demonizomai. Now I wanna show you every Greek concordance and interpretation of the New Testament, I'll put it on the screen right now, of the word demonizomai. Okay, this is, this is every definition we have of all the resources uh, to us from the original manuscripts of the Word of God. Every time demonizomai is mentioned, what does it mean? It means to be possessed by a hostile spirit, to be demon-possessed, to be demon-possessed, to be possessed by a demon or an evil spirit, on and on and on, to be possessed by a demoniac. Like, like take that off the screen. So when you, when, you, when you hear things like, I show this to you, because when you hear things like, well, Christians can't be possessed, but they can be demonized, it's the same thing as saying, Christians can't be possessed, but they can be possessed. It's the same thing. Thing. And this isn't just semantics, you guys. I pra Look, I practice deliverance and exorcisms. I have, have encountered witches and warlocks. And when demons manifest, you guys, I lead that person to Jesus Christ because demons cannot re-enter. They can come back and attack, but they cannot come back and inhabit the person. The belief that Christians can be demonized. It encourages Christians to address deception as though it were possession, and it creates this perpetual bondage experience in their life. The people, listen to me, church, the only people I know that are under the symptoms of demonization or possession are the people that believe they can be demon-possessed. That's the, only, that's the only people. The enemy loves to exaggerate his power over us. And I'm not saying the enemy can't attack us. I'll get to that. But there is a fine line between vigilance and paranoia. And Christians can get trapped into this ideology of needing to address bondage again and again and again. Because, listen, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's a flesh issue. Maybe it's, an, maybe it's a stronghold or a deception of your mind where your thoughts are not aligned to the word of God. And they're dealing with things as if they were possession. And so they're never getting to the root of the deception. So they have to keep going into session of deliverance after session of deliverance after session. And it's a lifestyle of bondage, deliverance, bondage, deliverance, bondage, deliverance. Listen to me. God did not call you to go from deliverance to deliverance, but from glory to glory. Okay. There's three reasons why there's some confusion around this today, I think, in the body of Christ. The first reason is this. I, I think believers confuse deliverance with exorcism. They, they, we're confusing this deliverance experience, which I'm, I'm grateful for deliverance, and we do need deliverance. But just because you were delivered doesn't mean there was a de you were demonized. Because I'll talk to people about this, and I'm trying to share the word of God, and then they'll tell me their experience. Oh, but I've seen. Oh, but I saw, and I experienced, and I even, I, you know, I was delivered, someone said, from depression. I was delivered from depression. Listen to me. To which I'd say, great, good. 
Just because you had an intense deliverance does not mean that you had a demonization. And I've seen intense deliverances where there is crying or screaming and there's, there is like an outward, you know, visual, like, like outcome, like they're, 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 just because there was an intense deliverance does not mean there was a demonization. And that's some confusion around this. The second reason I think there's confusion around this is that believers are responding a lot of times to erroneous teaching, false teaching. For instance, there's, there's some false teaching that demons can't inhabit your spirit because that's where the Holy Spirit lives in your spirit, but demons can inhabit your body or your soul, and that is just not biblical and not true. Let me share with you the word of God, which is truth, and the truth is what sets us free. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, or do you not know that your what? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So no, 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 you're, you're, you're not this condominium where you have this condo of your body, a condo of your soul, and a condo of your spirit. And the Holy Spirit is only renting out the spirit part of you, and the devil can rent out this part of you, and he can rent out, that's not, no, 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 you are owned by God. All of you, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, is what the scriptures say. First John chapter 5, 18 says, we know that whoever is born of God does not continue in sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, look what it says, and the wicked one does not touch him. Come on, the devil can't touch you, guys. Now, when you even look at that Greek word, that touch, what that word touch means, it means you cling to or fasten to. No, 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 so he can't hold on to you. He can't cling to you. So there's confusion around this is because some believers are under and they're receiving false teaching and error, and there is, they're responding sometimes to the programming to the program they're seeing. Someone says, this is what it looks like, and this is what it is, and this is what, and, 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 and Christian, there's, I think, a lot of people who desperately want to be free, and they're like, then if that's what it is, I'll do that then, fine. Just get me free off of this thing. What does it look like? What do I need to do? And they're responding to the programming of erroneous teaching. It's the power of suggestion. It, it, you look, you could be bound and attacked, but not inhabited and controlled as a follower of Jesus Christ. The third, the third reason why there's confusion around this, and this one is very upsetting to me, but believers can have mental strongholds and emotional wounds that look like demonic manifestations. And I've seen too many people taken advantage of by this religious ideology. It's a lie from Satan that keeps people in bondage that Christians can be demonized. And I'm telling you right now, look, if this is not true, if this is a lie, where do all lies come from? comes from the father of lies. So this is a bondage, a religious ideology, a legalistic bondage that is keeping people bound. Now, my, my wife, let me give you an example. My wife, used to, when we first got married and we were in the military, she struggled with anxiety and panic attacks. Some of you guys know this because she has since been delivered and set free. She's wrote curriculum for freedom from anxiety. We still do it, to, we do it year after year, and it's done now through our counseling center, through licensed therapists, lead people through freedom from anxiety. But when she was having anxiety and panic, like here's, here's what anyone who deals with this will tell you. You will feel whatever you fear, okay? And, and those of you that know anxiety, know what I'm talking about, or if you've been around somebody who knows it, because she would watch a, a uh, she'd watch the news, or she'd hear, read a, a report about something, she'd hear a story uh, about someone had a, like this literally happened, someone had a heart condition that just came out of nowhere, it was, did not look like there was any kind of malady or wrong, but they straight just died, it was an abnormal heart condition. After hearing about that, hours later, she started manifesting the feelings that she feared. She's, her heart started beating fast and, and, and her side started to go numb. Her vision blurred, blacked out and narrowed and she started losing faculty of her, of her own body, you guys. Why? Because you feel what you fear. Anyone with anxiety, panic, OCD, depression, anyone will, will understand this. Now, take that person. Take someone with even mild or moderate anxiety. Sit them in a room like this with someone in authority like me telling you, you can be demon-possessed. You're gonna have a demon on you, and this is what it looks like, and this is what you're gonna feel, and this is what, and this is, and this, and, and then, and I'm looking at you and I'm saying it. Guess what? You're, if I start walking down your eye, you go, ha ha! I feel it! I feel it! And I make light of it a little bit, but it, I know it's not funny. I'm not trying to make fun of anyone who believes that. I'm not. I'm just trying to trying to get you to understand here that there's some reasons why there is confusion here. There, like Christians, 
with either emotional wounds or mental strongholds or even mental illness, they're having breakdowns and they're being taken advantage of, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally. Now, you need to know there are some people that call themselves Christian leaders who are intentionally manipulating and dictating and, and dominating Christians and, and taking advantage of mental and emotional wounds and they're having breakdowns and they're being taken advantage of. And whether it's intentional or unintentional, it is a lie of Satan and I ain't gonna allow it here in this body. You understand? Yes. Amen, somebody? Yes. So, so the, and what's the problem here is that the emotional or mental stronghold is worsened because of this experience. When you stop, listen, when you stop believing the lie that you can be possessed or you can be demonized, when you cut that off, you stop believing that lie and you put your faith in the truth of God's word, your joy is gonna come back. Your victory is gonna come back. Your freedom is gonna come back when you stop believing the lie. This is a religious legalistic bondage. There is no spirit stronger than the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen, somebody? Okay, this is one way the enemy attacks. It's through possession or demonization. Well, who then? Well, that's unbelievers, people who are not covered and bought by the blood of Jesus, who aren't his, who aren't children of God. They need deliverance from demonization. Now, we need deliverance from strongholds. Christians still can be, here's the other attack of the enemy, not possession, but oppression. Not possession, but oppression. So no, demons can't be demon possessed. Christians can't be demon possessed, but they can certainly be attacked in their minds in their will, in their emotions, in their bodies. They can be troubled, pressed, harassed, depressed, in bondage, bruised. Like that, we can, we can be oppressed by the enemy. Let me say it like this. If someone broke into your house with a weapon, they do not now own your house, but they sure are influencing it. Or if I were to consume a bunch of alcohol and take drugs, the drugs don't own me. I'm not under ownership of the drugs, but I am under the influence, they would say, right? I'm under the influence of it. So you can't give influence by doors you open, okay, to spirits of oppression in your life. Let me show it to you. Ephesians chapter 4, 27 says, leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to him. See, this is speaking to Christians, you guys. This is talking about to the church. Paul is saying, you open the door whenever you blatantly disregard God's word. When you clicked on that porn site, sir, ma'am, it wasn't just something that was pleasurable to your flesh. Listen, it was more spiritual than you think. You opened a door to demonic oppression. Is this too hard for you guys? You're all with me today. This is important stuff. Are you going to hell? No, you're bought with a price. God owns you. You are owned by God. But I'm telling you, you're opening the door to something that is going to influence you because it's more spiritual than you think. Okay, Luke chapter 22, Jesus gives us this peek into the spiritual realm when he's talking to Peter about how he would deny him on the night he was betrayed. Look what it says. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus was giving us some insight to a spiritual realm dynamic that happened where Satan was after, wanted, and even asked for Peter. But, but Jesus says, don't worry, Peter. I, I've already taken care of it. You ain't, this ain't, he ain't gonna get you. You are gonna come victorious out of this and even better out of this because you're gonna strengthen your brothers afterwards, okay? So he didn't need to rebuke anything. He wasn't demonized. There was just oppression of the enemy that was attacking Peter that he needed to be aware of, the scheme, okay? There are four ways the enemy can oppress you. Four ways. The first three, I want you to think about like this. The first three are actually the open doors to oppression into your life. And the, and the last one, the fourth one I'll give you is, the, is probably like the outcome of, of oppression in your life, okay? Four ways. Four ways the enemy can oppress you. Number one is deception. And we've talked about that a lot. He is, the, the, Jesus said, the father of lies. The, the crazy thing about this, there was this new research, and they do this every several years, but Barner Research tells us that 50% of Christians do not believe Satan is a real person, but only a personification of evil. 50%. This is at the heart of the deception. If you don't know that you are in a war, then you will lose to the war every time. Okay, he, he wants to deceive. When you believe that lie, you enthrone and empower. When you believe the deception, you are opening a door for demonic oppression into your life through deception. That's an open door. Number two is temptation. 
Every one of us has experienced that. The temptation of our flesh, it's like the, the fisherman's bait. It looks good, but we don't know once we bite that thing, man. It's a hook in our mouth trying to lead and lure us and pull us outside of the will of God. Tempt sin is like the Trojan horse. You know what I mean? It's like, it looks like it's desirable, but then when you invite that thing in, man, it dominates and destroys you. And, and like God, God can operate in your life only through faith. That's how God operates in your life, through faith. Satan can only operate in your life through sin. When you open the door to this temptation, you give in to the temptation, it is an open door to demonic oppression. The third open door is accusation. Accusation. We are told in Revelation that, that he is the accuser of the brethren. And this is what he tries to do. Satan is the accuser who wants to remind you of your sin. He wants to remind you of your past. He wants to remind you of your unworthiness to be in God's family. He wants you to question your salvation or forget God's love and faithfulness. Here's what Satan does. Satan goes, look at your sinfulness. God goes, look at Jesus. Okay? This is, but when you fall for the accusation, you allow his accusation to fill you with guilt and shame, you are opening a door of access to the enemy in your life. Okay, the fourth really outcome of this, this you know, oppression is torment. And the enemy can, through the open doors that we give him, he can torment us. We can be in bondage, bruised, beaten, harassed in our minds and our bodies and our wills. Yes, absolutely. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the apostle Paul says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Look what he calls this thorn, though, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to what the thorn is. I mean, without the speculation about what it is, here's what we do know, that it was from Satan, and it was tormenting to him. Now, he was not demonized. He didn't need to be, like, delivered from a demon. He was being tormented and oppressed in his flesh by something that was an attack of the enemy on his life. Here's what I, I just, I want you to, I don't want you to get over, way over here in the extreme, and, 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 and you know, go to the extreme of believing that he's more powerful than he actually is, but I don't want you to go way over here and not live like you're not in a war, okay? I need you to realize it's more spiritual than you think, and maybe, yes, you can still, uh, you know, apply, you know, strategy and, and intellect to, you know, solving your problems, but, but just maybe if you actually applied not only strategic solutions but spiritual solutions, maybe you'd get a taste of freedom that you never tasted before. Maybe there would be like a whole new level of freedom that God would want to bring you into if you, if you didn't just address it physically and naturally, but started addressing it spiritually. Because we can't, if, if you are a child of God, then you need to abide by the truth of this word. And, and the truth says that there are demonic spirits. In fact, let me show you in your notes, eight spirits of oppression. There, there are a lot of spirits, but there are eight like primary spirits throughout the word of God that we see that are oppressing spirits that you and I, we just need to look at that and go, okay, well, it's more spiritual than I think. It, it just is. It just, it just has to be. It just has to be more spiritual. And I can't just act like things aren't happening here because the, the Bible is clear. The truth will set me free. Here are the spirits of oppression. Number one is the spirit of fear. Okay, so yes, you can have fear. That can be an emotion that you have. But, but uh, instead of you just trying to build your confidence and trying to build your self-esteem and stuff, sure, do that. But maybe you should apply spiritual solutions to your spirit of fear as well. So yeah, let's get, let's get more confident. But maybe we should rebuke or deal with the spirit of fear that's operating through this as well. Maybe we should do, we should do both because it's more spiritual than you think. In fact, turn to your neighbor and tell them, it's more spiritual than you think. What's the spirit of fear? The spirit of fear is a stronghold, not like a healthy fear of God or even a healthy fear of safety, like being safe, that's normal. But I'm talking about like a stronghold that overwhelms people with anxiety, such as fear of failure and, and death and isolation. That stronghold can restrict people, Christians, from accomplishing the will of God in their life. This spirit of fear. The second spirit of oppression is a spirit of death. The spirit of death, see, the enemy wants to steal, kill and destroy. So this stronghold manifests through these constant thoughts of suicide, murder, self-mutilation, even abnormal grief. While grief is absolutely normal, there is an abnormal grief that can grip you where you cannot get out of it for months or years to be getting out of it. That is because it is possibly not just a feeling, maybe it's a spirit that we need to start addressing spiritual solutions to, okay? Number three is a spirit of depression. Even in the midst of being blessed and experiencing God's blessing, 
People can have recurrent fits of depression, and it'll come like a dark cloud over their life. They might pray and fast and make resolution, but it's, it just gets worse, and it could be because that dark cloud of depression, maybe it's not just mental, it's spiritual. The Bible calls it a spirit of heaviness, okay? And so we just need to look at, look, this is the word of God, you guys, and the truth will set you free. The spirit of depression is a spirit of oppression. Number four is a spirit of lust. This spirit is behind all the acts of adultery, fornication, pornography, homosexuality, prostitution. It's often the spirit of lust. And engaging in these acts only opens the door to the oppression in your life. Number five, the spirit of addiction, called as well the spirit of bondage, the spirit of bondage or addiction. This is the stronghold behind all addictions to like alcohol or drugs or any destructive addiction, gambling, whatever. The spirit of bondage drives addictions and, and obviously habits can be formed naturally. And there's even physical chemical dependencies that we can create with and we can see it physically. But here's what I'm saying. It's more spiritual than you think. In addition to the chemical natural dependency that's being created, you're opening a door to demonic oppression. So it's not just, so let's deal, with the, let's deal with the chemical dependency. Let's go get help. Let's get ourselves checked in. Let's go to celebrate recovery on Thursday nights. Let's get some accountability partner. Let's deal with that. But let's also deal with the spiritual bondage that I'm experiencing through the spirit of oppression. I need to come against that thing as well because it's more spiritual than you think. Number six is the spirit of infirmity. The spirit of infirmity. Now, I'm not saying every time you get sick is a devil. That's not what I'm saying, okay? But, but we just have to be, guys, it is very clear in the Bible that there are spirits of oppression that can cause illness, that can cause sickness, even mental illnesses. Like, like this can, like this is a spirit that can happen. So yes, please take your Z-Pack, go ahead. Please put some cream on that rash, go ahead, please, okay? But I'm just saying, maybe in addition to that, we should realize that we are, we are more spiritual than we think, and we also need to deal with a spirit of infirmity and illness as well. Number seven is the spirit of pride. The spirit of pride is the stronghold that causes arrogance, revenge, rebellion, a lust for power, cruelty, jealousy. This is a particularly deceptive stronghold it's, it's, what, it's what Satan had that got him kicked out of heaven, this, this, this spirit of pride, and he loves to use it against the children of God to get them isolated, the spirit of pride. Number eight, and the last one is the spirit of divination. The spirit of divination, like we read in Acts chapter 16 with Paul. This spirit operates through cults very often, Freemasonry. I'm gonna offend some people, Mormonism. I'm gonna offend some more people, Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology, Secret Society, New Age, fortune telling, black magic, it's, its main assignment is to deceive. If you grew up in a home where you guys, someone worshiped idols or crystals or was involved in the occult, I wanna encourage you to come against that in the name of Jesus and take authority and break that in Jesus' name. Okay, because that's not a game. Why? It's more spiritual than you think. Okay, it's, it's more spiritual. So no matter where you're at today, you might be here today and you, you might have... Um, Things coming against you, man, that you didn't know. That it's more spiritual. Think fear, lust, pride. There, there are just some things that are uh, that maybe you're applying the right solutions physically or naturally, mentally. You're going through the right steps, but you feel like you just can't break through on this thing. Maybe it's because it's more spiritual than you think. And I'd like to help you get deliverance today. And that, that word is very, it's it's hijacked in a lot of ways. Let me just say it like this: I want you to be free. So let me give you eight steps of freedom that you can practice if you are under today or at any time under any attack of the enemy. You have authority and victory and you can walk this out yourself, by the way. How many know you can do self-deliverance? You can, you can get free, man. You can walk this out. You have authority. You have a victory. You have the name of Jesus. So you can walk this out yourself. In Luke chapter 10, the Bible says that the 72 disciples returned with joy to Jesus and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, the reason why he, he's bringing Satan up is because he wants them to know the context, like this is the demonic powers that you're against. But the second reason why he did is because he wanted to know where he is. He's fallen, okay? This, he is not the person in authority. In fact, he goes, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, which are caricatures of demonic spirits, and to overcome all the power of the enemy. 
nothing will harm you. Listen to me, child of God. You have been given authority to overcome all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. However, he says, don't rejoice that spirit submits to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. So what does this look like? Since I've been given authority, man, I don't have to live under this cloud, under dominion, feeling like I, I, I don't have my reins on, I don't have freedom, I don't have control. You, you don't have to live that way, you can be free. Eight steps to walk this out. Number one, you gotta recognize that it's more spiritual than you think. I gotta recognize this, I gotta recognize there's, there's a spiritual battle going on Yes, I see physical things, I see chemical things, but there is a spiritual battle going on that needs the power of God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need to recognize this. Jesus, when he said in John 8 that the truth will set you free, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Remember how they responded to Jesus? Let me show you in John 8, 33. They go, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How are you saying we're gonna be set free? These people were deceived. Listen to me, deception will never bring you freedom. Only desperation can get you free, okay? So I gotta recognize that this is more spiritual than I've been realizing here, okay? Uh, number two, after you recognize what it is, we need to repent. And that's not some religious ugly word. All that word means is to change your mind. You need to start thinking differently about the battle. So we repent, change our mind from any known sin in our life, any known sin, any open doors, deception, accusation, temptation. I've opened any doors. I need to repent and close these things in Jesus' name. Acts 3.19 tells us why. He says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come. Look, repent is not a bad thing, man. It's a beautiful thing. God wants to wipe it. He wants to purify you. He wants to refresh you. So when you recognize and you change your mind about it, that's what that means. Change your pattern of thinking. It needs to come into agreement with God and God's word about it. When I do that, when I recognize and repent, I can do number three, I can renounce. I can renounce this thing. And this is something you got to do out loud. And you got to get comfortable declaring, I renounce. Most Christians miss the difference between repent and renounce. And because of that, a lot of believers are in cycles of habitual sin in their life. They're never really free. So what does it really mean to renounce something? Remember, repent means to change your mind. Renounce means to turn away from. That's what that means. Now, sometimes... People try to renounce sin before they change their mind about sin. So they try an adjustment to their behavior before they were transformed in their mind. And what happens is it just gets them frustrated because they always fall back into the pattern of their mind that they never change. So, so what do we need to do? You got to start with repentance. We got to start with agreeing with what God says, changing my mind to what he says about sin in my life. That I will have no place. It is wrong. It has no place in my life. I'm not going to allow it in my life, not even in small portions. Sometimes we even deceive ourselves when we try to repent of something, and in the back of our mind, we're going, we know we're going to go back to that thing. We know it. We're, we're just going to come right back to it. So first, repent. Change your mind, and then renounce. Forsake sin in all forms, in all measures, and for all time. 2 Corinthians 4.2 says, Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor, look what he says, do we distort the word of God. I'm not going to change the word of God to adapt to what I want to do and my habits and my lifestyle choices. I'm not going to live in deception. I'm going to submit and surrender to the word of God in my life. I am going to, uh, I'm going to renounce, so you got to verbally, like I renounce the secret sin. You say it out loud, I renounce the guilt. I renounce the shame. And when you do that, number three, you can move to number four, which is to release. Again, you got to verbally declare I release myself from the spirit of fear. Go ahead. Let's work on, like I said, confidence, stuff like that. But you need to, I release myself from the spirit of pride. I release myself from that spirit of lust, spirit of depression, spirit of suicide. I release this. When you do that, I'm telling you, you might feel something like break off you. You may feel like something lift off you. Even joy and peace as you practice your authority in Jesus' name, you will even feel things being replaced in your life. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know what that means to cast? It means to throw off. You got to release those things off of you. When you do that, I'm telling you, you're going you're gonna to feel something live off you when you release it and you say it and declare it with your mouth. When you release it though, number five, you got to replace it. 
You gotta replace, you gotta forcefully and intentionally replace that space. This is what 2 Corinthians 3.17 says. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? See, real freedom isn't the absence of strongholds. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. So God just doesn't want to deliver you. He wants to fill you. That, that's, that's what freedom is. For, so we got to replace the space. For example, if you spent your evenings hanging out with the wrong crowd, now you got to spend your evenings hanging out with the right crowd. If you spent your mornings getting drunk, now you got to spend your mornings getting drunk on the Word of God. You know, you got you, you to replace it. So you replace what you renounce. You don't just remove the enemy, you replace the enemy. Number six is resist. Come on, are you getting something out of this, you guys? Are you getting something? Then we got to, number six is resist. I, see, in the word of God, our posture towards the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, the Bible tells us we are to wrestle against, battle against, to resist, okay? There are, it is an active resistance that we are called. Nowhere in the word of God is it a passive language that we have in our posture towards the enemy or the spiritual realm. We need to resist him actively because he's coming again and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's going to try to deceive. He's going to try to accuse. He's going to try to tempt. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. He wants to have mastery over you. And as long as we are living in this flesh and on this world, there's a battle that we need to fight. So we need to resist, okay? We need to be ready. We need to be armored up to resist the enemy. Number seven is to renew your mind. Renew your mind to the identity of Christ. A lot of times we can repent enough to be forgiven. We can renounce it enough to get some separation from that thing. But a lot of times we don't renew our mind enough to be free. Because you can repent, forgiven, renounce, and you got separation. But if you never change your mind, you will never be free. Until you, in, until you actually remodel what's going on up here. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I got to think different. I'll never be free until I think differently. You ever re remodeled your house? Anyone ever remodeled your house or your room? That's what you need to do up here, man. You need to remodel the way, the pattern of your furniture in your head, the way you move through the, the space in your mind. It needs to change. It needs to change to your identity in Christ and to the culture of the kingdom of heaven and not this world. I need to renew my mind. And lastly, number eight, if you want to be free, you got to get rooted in the house of God. We got to, we got to put down some roots. Psalm 92 verse 13 says, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. See, it's, it's community and, and, and being close to other brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. It's the missing component to a lot of people's freedom. You know why this is so important, you guys? Because Satan loves to attack lone wolves. He loves to isolate the sheep from the flock and attack those sheep that are off isolated. The moment you get your freedom, listen to me, get grounded. If you want to walk in your destiny, it's God's will for you to be a part of a local church. Remember, listen, God is building a body. He ain't just building you. And all throughout the scriptures, when, we talk, when, it, when the scriptures exhort to us about spiritual warfare, it's never an individual thing. It's never a, like a one-on-one -on -one battle. It's always a battle of we against him and them. It's never you and him. You ain't standing alone. You got to stand rooted in the body of Christ. Now, let me give you three things. Here. If you want to get rooted, if this year you want to walk out some freedom and get rooted, I'm going to give you three application steps, okay? Number one, join the family of God. Okay, if it ain't here at Discovery, join somewhere. Be a part of the family of God. Next Sunday, we have our class called Track One, where we give you an opportunity to learn the beliefs and our values and who we are, our culture at Discovery, and to make a decision, could this be your church home? But if you want to walk out freedom, that is an important step for you to get rooted. Come next week at 1.15 and learn and see, test and see, could this be a home where I plant my roots? The second thing to get rooted is to get into a small group. Like get connected to the community of Christ. There, our small groups are launching all of them next week. There's 168 of them for you to choose from. Let me even, let me give you some suggestions. If you're new to the things of God, there's a class, a small group called Foundations Level One. The, the curriculum of that class is called Rooted. And if you've never gone through any kind of discipleship course where you learn the foundational things of the word of God, of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, that is one I wanna encourage you to take as part of your discipleship journey. There's a lot of you that I would love to take our freedom group. This is a, a curriculum we just released 
called Freedom, The Eight Steps to Healing and Transformation. Now, in this series, I went over all new material. This was just like all led by the Spirit every week. because None of the stuff is actually in here. There are eight, the eight steps to healing and transformation that you can walk out in a freedom group. We separate them, men's and women's groups. Find one. I'd love for you to get connected to one of those. They're online. They're on our app. Find one. Here, last, last step. You want to get rooted? Get baptized. Go all in. Take that step of faith, you guys. There are so many people that have given their life to Christ in the last three, four weeks here at Discovery. Hundreds, thousands. You, you're in here today. Your next step, if you really want to walk out freedom, is to demonstrate your faith publicly. And here's what I'll say about this. I've been saying it all day. It's more spiritual than you think. It's not just water in a tank. It's not just getting wet. God meets your faith there. And you will go from glory to glory as you honor God and get baptized publicly, declaring that you're a follower of Jesus. It is more spiritual than you think. Jesus gave his disciples authority, victory. It's already yours in Christ. He says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Listen, stop fighting just naturally and start fighting spiritually. And only then will you have the victory that is yours already in Christ. Can I pray that over you? Come on, with every head bowed and eye closed in this place. God, we thank you so much for the victory that is ours. We thank you, Jesus, for disarming all powers and all authorities, triumphing over them by the cross. God, today we realize that my life is more spiritual than I've been thinking. Help me, God, to live my life in alignment with your word that there is a reality of warfare that is happening. And I need to engage not just strategically and mentally and emotionally, but I need to apply spiritual solutions to my marriage, to my mind, to my, to my habits. God, I need to fight spiritual enemies with spiritual weapons. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.